Okay, now we are, we have all the panelists here, I understand. Um, now we are the last panel of this conference, and which has been very intense, and if you thought there was nothing new, there was always something new in the next panel, so you could see that. It's always come, become interesting more and more. So I think uh, it is my pleasure and my honor to, to introduce yourself to Engin Kongalu, we have a great colleague from the World Water Assessment Program, a program specialist who has been working and supporting you on water for some years and, and doing an excellent job. Um, Engin, not many people say thank you to us or we think, say thank you to each other. And uh, now, uh, Engin, the, the floor is yours. Josefina, thank you very much for this nice introduction. I'm humbled by your words, and it's, it's very honoring to hear that the work that we do for UM Water is being appreciated by partners and as well as by the, by the public at large. Now, because we are the last panelist, because we are getting ready to wrap up this three-day-long conference, doesn't prevent me from thanking you, Josefina, once again for this well-organized conference, um, intellectual, um, intellectually rich contributions, discussions, and uh, it's more than a pleasure to take the floor in this conference. And uh, thank you for the invitation, thank you for the organization, and we will continue to collaborate in the near future. Um, ladies and gentlemen, now, um, it's been a long three-day marathon, and I know that you are all tired. Some of you have already packed, looking at your watches, uh, waiting for the train or, uh, you know, the, the flight to back to your home. So um, what I will do is that, um, in fact, Josefina told me to make uh, a comprehensive uh, rich overview presentation, but I will um, be quite um, succinct in my presentation. It will not take more than 10, 15 minutes. Uh, what I'm aiming at is that um, after a short presentation, we will have rich Q&A session with the, um, with the panelists um, distinguished panelists who are sitting with me around the table. Now, um, if you allow me to, to, to start my presentation, in the last two days, the close interlinkage between water and energy has been emphasized um, on many occasions. Just to recap, energy is both a user as well as means for producing and delivering um, water-related services. In fact, energy can account for 60 to 80 percent of water transportation and water treatment-related costs, and 14 percent of total water utility costs. Um, then we look at the projections for uh, water and energy demand. Um, to be frank, those projections are quite worrying. Um, as you see on this slide, by 2035, worldwide energy demand is projected to grow by more than one-third, and demand for electricity is expected to grow by 70%. Equally, global water demand in, in terms of water withdrawal is projected to increase by some 55% by mid-century. This implies the fact that the current um, struggle, the current competition among the sectors for the scarce water resources is forecast to intensify in almost all the countries around the world. Under business as usual scenario, by 2030, half of the world population will be living in, in areas of high water stress. The sad part of this story is that none of these statistics, none of these facts and figures are shocking news to managers 
to decision makers working in different sectors. The fact of the matter is that the international community is well aware of the, the challenges surrounding water and, and, and food, water and energy nexus. <coughs> Um, in, but the problem is that all those problems, all those challenges have so far been addressed in, in an isolation through a sectoral approach. Consequently, if a solution is to be found to water, energy, and if I may add, food nexus, there is a need for the decision makers and the managers in all sectors um, to start thinking about, um, to start considering broader influences and cross-sectoral impacts of the ac actions that they take. Um, what we are proposing, what we are suggesting is that we move from compartmental, silo kind, um, uh, sectoral approach to a broader um, consultation to a broader um, exchange of um, ideas, a broader dialogue, uh, if you if you wish to say, uh, so that um, we ensure that co-benefits co and trade-offs are considered and appropriate safeguards are put in place. The 2014 edition of the World Water Development Report, which will be launched this March in Tokyo on the occasion of the World Water Day, specifically focuses on the theme of water and energy. In fact, what I have presented so far are some of the findings and recommendations of the World Water Development Report. To continue with the report, it talks about innovative approaches that are necessary to be able to tackle some of the water and energy challenges. And those innovative approaches are cross-sector cooperation to leverage possible synergies, integrated planning for water and energy to decrease costs and ensure sustainability, um, decentralized services, assessing trade-offs at the national level, as well as demand-side interventions. These innovative approaches at least can help overcome the, the infrastructure uh, financing gap, which is far greater for water than energy services. The report also makes an attempt to remind us the obvious that there is a clear need to, to create an enabling environment so that um, a sustainable solution and uh, mutually beneficial development of water and energy services can be realized. Uh, some of the actions that are necessary to ensure uh, public reaction, public response, is that um, developing coherent national policies and creation of legal and institutional frameworks, um, ensuring reliable data and statistics to inform the decision-making process. Um, raising awareness through education, training, and media services. Ensuring the availability and the presence of finance, uh, necessary financial resources. And the last but not the least, um, supporting innovation and research into technological development. Talking about technology, there are many um, existing as well as potential solutions that can be um, that can be utilized um, for, for um, addressing water and energy related uh, problems. Um, both the World Water Development Report and its dedicated case studies volume are rich sources where promising examples from all over the world can be found. In fact, some of those case studies that we featured in our report, in our forthcoming report, is um, solar-powered seawater desalination plants, uh, drinking water hydropower stations, charcoal and biogas generation from wastewater, 
um, energy self-sufficient wastewater treatment plants, and um, water and electricity utility companies working hand in hand to be able to improve the efficiency in production and delivery of energy and water services. As a side note, many of the examples that we highlighted in our report um, clearly shows the potential role that industry can play in generating and, and, and creating um, innovative solutions for the, uh, to, to ensure um, best possible use of water and energy resources. What I mentioned until now in my presentation is just the tip of the iceberg. To be able to provide you with a broader perspective, um, we have some prominent experts with us um, who will enrich the discussion by sharing uh, with us their, their expertise. We have Mr. Mark Smith from the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Mark is still sitting over there. Uh, we have Mr. Enrica Playan from uh, the European Joint Programming Initiative. Enrique, he is right there. Uh, Ms. We have Mr. Paul Yilia. Um, he has many hats. Uh, you saw him a few minutes ago, one hour ago, sitting here, uh, not the same chair. Was it the same chair? It was the same chair, but with a different hat. This time he is sitting uh, with the hat of the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And finally, we have uh, Professor Paolo Fulignati from University of Pisa, Italy. Now, I will tell you a bit about uh, what uh, the, the institutions, the agencies of the panelists, and give you one example out of many of their projects aiming to build partnerships, aiming to create solutions uh, to achieve uh, a sustainable future. The International Union for Conservation of Nature is the world's oldest and largest global environmental network dedicated to finding pragmatic solutions to most pressing and most pressing environment and development challenges. Well, thanks to its extensive membership profile and linked to tens of thousands of researchers around the globe, IUCN is an influential international organization promoting, supporting scientific research and building partnerships. Um, experience and knowledge about um, natural resources management, energy production, engineering, um, agriculture, those kind of experiences and knowledge is abundant. But the real problem we have, the real challenge that we are facing is to, to be able to actively bring those um, information and knowledge together so that, um, so that um, we can move towards practical solutions which can be utilized at the, at the field level with success. Um, the project, which is co-led by IUCN and um, International Water Agency, um, International Water Association, uh, called Nexus Dialogue on Water Infrastructure Solutions, directly aims at that particular problem by forming a platform on which partnerships can be built by bringing key stakeholders together, by bringing them together so that they can work together to be able to create uh, partnerships so that collaborative steps, so that um, solutions can be found uh, for implementing uh, water infrastructure um, that will accelerate action on optimization of the nexus. What has been done um, so far there are uh, two regional workshops have been organized, one in Africa and Latin America, and the third one is in the pipeline. And those workshops, they have one particular target, and that target was to identify 
the barriers. What are the technical, institutional, financing and political barriers in the field? And then identify practical st steps to develop solutions. Mark will tell more about this particular, this, this innovative project during the Q&A session. Um, the national research programs in Europe, without any doubt, is among the best in the world. But the challenge is that individual European countries working in isolation, they cannot tackle today's global problems. They cannot find solutions by themselves to today's global problems, such as um, supplying uh, necessary, sufficient uh, food and energy for the growing uh, global population. European Joint Programming Initiative, although it's quite recent, uh, it's, it was uh, launched in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, um, it gives us the hope, it brings excitement in the sense that this particular project has the potential uh, to bring European countries together, to pull, to pull them together so that um, um, one giant European research area can be generated where solutions, common solutions can be found to global problems. Um, this is particularly interesting because we are looking at the possibility of uh, the brightest researchers, the best brains working in Europe together, utilizing the best research facilities in Europe to be able to create technology, to be able to enhance technology uh, so that innovation can be promoted, so that solutions to nexus challenges can be found um, in the near future, before it's too late. Um, as a part of JPI, uh, there are 10 initiatives in place, but the initiative which is relevant to our discussion today is the Water JPI. And Water JPI is even a more recent initiative. It was launched in 2010, only a few years ago. Uh, but a considerable progress uh, has been achieved until now. Um, as you can see on this map, there are already 19 country partners and European Commission is following and feeding into the process. Um, the aim of the, the water JPI is to harmonize national water research, development, and innovation activities. And another target, another aim, is to involve at least two-thirds of public research, development, and innovation investment in participating member states. Um, Water JPI is trying to tackle the big challenge, and that big challenge is to achieve sustainable water systems for a sustainable economy in Europe and abroad. The research and innovation agenda of Water JPI is it's extensive, but it can be uh, summarized under five main topics. And those topics are um, ecosystems, maintaining ecosystem sustainability, developing safe water systems for the citizens, promoting competitiveness in the water industry, implementing a water-wise, bio-based economy, and closing the water cycle gap. Enrique will tell us more about this interesting project in a few minutes. Um, our third panelist is uh, from IASA, Paul. Um, the International Institute for Applied System Analysis is um, a research organization, a research agency. But uh, they are dealing with um, issues, problems that are simply too large or too complex to be solved by a simple country or academic discipline. Um, the IASA is a research hub 
which brings together a wide spectrum of, of scientists. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of scientists uh, working in a wide, extensive research network extending to 65 countries. And uh, the bottom line is that ESA puts the system analysis into the service of humanity, society, so that uh, to be able to improve human and social well-being and protect ecosystems. Um, we are ESA and WAP, the World Water Assessment Program, my secretariat. We are partners in crime because we are working together uh, um, on a project um, entitled Water Futures and Solutions. Through this project, it's a scenario exercise. We are looking into the future, mid-century, 2050, what is likely to happen, freshwater resources, and to be able to, to, to give um, politicians and decision makers um, the full picture we, are, uh, we have identified a number of um, drivers, and one of those drivers is science, technology, and of course, innovation is a part of it. Uh, Paul will talk about what ESA does and the, our joint project on water futures and solutions. Um, to conclude my words, um, as our last panelist, we have uh, Paolo, he is a distinguished professor um, who works in uh, the University of Pisa, um, Italy, and um, he will make a very short, brief presentation on uh, integration of geothermal resources into regional energy planning in Umbria in Italy. So uh, with this, I'm giving the floor to Paolo for a short presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Angie, for uh, introducing me, and good afternoon to all of you. I'm uh, Paolo Fulignati, and uh, I'm a researcher at the University of Pisa in the Health Sciences Department, and I'm part of uh, uh, the group that uh, work on uh, geothermics and uh, volcanology of my uh, university. This, uh, this um, work, uh, was born uh, uh, due to a collaboration, a partnership between the uh, government of Umbria region uh, in central Italy and uh, the health sciences departments of the universities of Pisa and Perugia. Uh, the objectives of, uh, of, this, uh, of this work uh, are devoted to the assessment of geothermal potential of Umbria region and sustainability of the possible geothermal exploitation either for power production and uh, direct uses. The scope is to promote and direct initiatives of possible industrial and private public uh, interested in the utilization of geothermal resources in, in Umbria. Why this? Because in the last uh, 20, 25 years, uh, new, new technology have been uh, developed uh, as concerned the, the, the utilization of geothermal energy. And uh, this uh, new technology provides uh, uh, commercial, commercially viable solutions for the exploitation of low and very low enthalpy geothermal resources, which are practical, practically ubiquitous all over the world. And also the, uh, these new technologies allow the highly competitive and environmentally safe utilization of the more localized medium and high enthalpy geothermal resources linked to thermal anomalies for power production. And uh, these are the reason, the main reason for which uh, the, um, the government of Umbria region wanted to be uh, updated about these uh, uh, possibilities and the potentialities of, uh, of uh, geothermal energy in, uh, in, uh, in Umbria region. Also because in the last uh, three, four years, 
uh, new uh, particular attention of uh, uh, many private companies has, devo has been de devoted to the, uh, the geothermal resources in, uh, in Italy that are, uh, whose uh, uh, exploitation is uh, um, underestimated for sure. We would like to underline uh, that these mov modern energy conversion technologies, in particular the, uh, the, the binary cycles, or she, organic Rankine cycle and uh, Kalina, uh, uh, that is in, at, at present is developing, uh, are able to produce electricity from fluids, from geothermal fluids, at temperature as low as about uh, around uh, 100, 110 degrees. So very low temperatures uh, of these geothermal fluids. And in particular, uh, this, uh, the power production occurs with zero emission in the environment and the total reinjection of geothermal fluids, exhausted fluids, allowing to uh, preventing any consumption of uh, water for power production. That is a fundamental aspect of, the, of, the, of this uh, technology. Uh, this nice picture is a, a small power plant in Austria, Altheim. This power plant produces one megawatt electric with the Rankine, organic Rankine cycle with a fluid of about, of about 110 degrees. And this is, of course, a nice uh, example, a small example, but probably uh, is uh, interesting for showing the uh, very low impact also by the uh, landscape point of view of this kind of, uh, of, uh, uh, of power plants. So we think that uh, this collaboration between uh, the, the, the universities, uh, the, the, the uh, research uh, centers and uh, public administration is a very, a very good example uh, and uh, uh, in particular to for the administration that want uh, to integrate geothermal energy into their energy budget and can give very positive responses as regards the economy and environmental protection to the energy needs of many communities as an alternative to the new renewable uh, energy resources. And this is particularly interest, interesting also for uh, developing countries that uh, in many cases have very good potentialities by the point of view of geothermal energy. The approach that uh, we, uh, we carried, we used uh, in this research, uh, take into account uh, the state of the art of the adva and adva advanced technologies available. Uh, in particular, we used the uh, numerical, mo numerical modeling uh, uh, simulation that uh, allows uh, very interesting uh, uh, reproduction of uh, fluid circulation in the subsoil of uh, um, uh, in the subsoil, so uh, hydrothermal circulation in a geothermal um, reservoir. So we can, uh, with this methodology, methodology we can uh, uh, make some forecast about the, uh, the temperature in the subsoil and the, the, the amount of fluids and so on. Very interesting. Uh, for this research, we, we based our, our research, our uh, elaboration, our uh, simulation. Uh, we based this research on the all available data uh, as concern uh, geothermics in the uh, Umbria region. And uh, for instance, geology, data from uh, deep wells that uh, uh, were drilled in the past in Umbria region, uh, either for um, hydrocarbon researches and also for geothermal research in the area of uh, Castel Giorgio, Toralfina, and the western part of the, of the, of the Umbria region. Uh, and uh, data from geophysics, so seismic lines, it looks uh, gravimetry uh, data, and geochemistry. Uh, the elaboration uh, of uh, all this data and the new uh, numerical modeling simulation we carried out um, have been used to uh, have been summarized in some uh, synthetic maps that report uh, um, 
particular uh, that summarize the results and report particular uh, aspects uh, interesting for uh, uh, geothermal purposes, of course. Uh, this, uh, this picture, for instance, uh, in this picture I reported the isobath of the top of carbonates that uh, in Umbria region can represent the, 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 the main potential geothermal reservoir. <laughs> Uh, and the isotherms at the top and bottom carbonates from numerical modeling uh, experimental results. The area in red uh, are some areas that uh, show particularly interesting uh, uh, results that um, probably uh, should be uh, considered for further uh, more, uh, more in-depth uh, investigations by other uh, uh, in this case, of course, uh, we need the, 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 the presence of also of private companies that uh, uh, are interested also by economic point of view and are able uh, uh, to uh, uh, make some investment for further, uh, further researches. This is a, a magnification of the previous uh, uh, at the end, uh, we uh, carried out uh, an Umbria geothermal zoning. We subdivided the uh, Umbria region in four main classes uh, of different uh, showing and reporting also possible, um, the possible use of geothermal resources in, the four, uh, main, in these four main classes. And uh, the temperature and the, the potential geothermal reservoir uh, a depth shallower than 3,000 meters. Uh, finally, we uh, tried to uh, make a theoretical geothermal potential calculation in the first five most promising uh, uh, areas of Umbria region as uh, deduced from uh, our research. And uh, we can see in this table uh, that uh, the, uh, the potential either for megawatt electric and also for megawatt thermics, quindi, uh, for direct uses, for instance, uh, are very, very interesting, are data uh, very, uh, very interesting. And the calculated uh, amount of uh, potential uh, saved CO2 emission in tons per, uh, per year uh, reach the values uh, really, uh, really great. And uh, this is, I think, a uh, good result of, uh, of this research. As a consequence, the conclusions uh, of this uh, uh, first uh, collaboration between uh, our department and uh, the, uh, the Umbria region, the, the government of Umbria region, uh, is, is, is represented by um, uh, the obtain, uh, obtaining an important sound science-based tool to help decision makers and private sector to, at first, first one, respond to the increasing energy needs. Second one, develop integrated planning as concerned the use and location of water resources because uh, um, we, can, we must take into account that uh, um, also uh, water without any uh, uh, thermal anomalies uh, may represent a good, uh, a good uh, potential for, uh, by the geothermal point of view. If uh, we think about, for instance, the, the use of heat pumps for uh, heating and cooling of uh, um, of uh, houses or district teething and so on. Third one, improve the sustainable, sustainable economic development through the utilization of these renewable clean energy resources and at the end, the increased involvement of the private sector in developing green economy approaches and technologies either for power and production and for direct uses of natural heat. And uh, at present in Italy, there is about uh, more than 50 uh, um, research permits for geothermics, for geothermal purposes at various stages of development, just because uh, uh, some um, companies are, uh, uh, are interested in this uh, 
uh, renewable, renewable uh, uh, energy uh, resources. Our department, uh, we collaborate with, uh, for instance, for, with uh, a couple of these uh, uh, companies, for instance, Sorgenia, that is the, 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 most, the, 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 the most important private company uh, of uh, power production in Italy, that have uh, uh, some uh, uh, lic license permits uh, in Munta Miata region and in southern Tuscany and also in northern Lazio. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this presentation. Now, uh, to get the discussion going, I will pose some cross-cutting questions to the panelists so that we can first warm up and then hopefully uh, with the participation of the audience, we can get into more detailed probing questions um, for the panelists. Um, also for ourselves, so that uh, we can talk a bit more about uh, the topic, the topic of this session, Innovation Partnerships on Water and Energy. So with this, um, the first question that I would like to ask to all panelists is, uh, what are the existing partnership opportunities in your field? that will help boost viable solutions to the nexus. Paul, if possible, I would like you, if you agree, I would like you to, to answer the last, because I know that you will uh, use um, a PowerPoint slides to be able to give a more explanation, more in-depth explanation. And as we have already, uh, they've been through two presentations, I don't want to have the third presentation right now, but in, in a few minutes' time. So um, with this question, uh, Enrique, perhaps <laughs> you might want to go first? I always want to go first. No problem. Thank you. Well, and I thank you very much for the question. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to discuss with you some of this nightmare of European coordination that I'm living through, and so this presentation is going to be some kind of therapy for myself, too. <laughs> and that's always good news. This and uh, yes. <laughs> existing opportunities within uh, my field to boost the, nex the nexus. Well, it very well fits into the problem that we are trying to solve. The, the European Commission decided that it was about time to promote the coordination of European countries in terms of research for selected topics, which were a major societal challenge. Now, if water is not one, you tell me what it is. And uh, the government of Spain, through the, the ministry in charge of research, of research Mineco at this time, uh, decided to step forward as a result of the expo in Zaragoza in 2008 and say that we had identified water as such a case. Now, the situation with energy has only become more and more interesting and more and more complicated in time. So the issue of the nexus has been identified with us as a very important issue to tackle. The situation in Europe is like this. Water research is addressed by the individual partner countries and by the European Commission. With the Commission, through the framework program, what today is called Horizon 2020, is spending about or investing about 130 million a year on water research in general. The member states, however, have much more funds to tackle the issue, some 370 million, and together it's about half a billion a year, which is not much money for those of you uh, belonging to the private sector or investing public money for infrastructures, but it is a lot of money for research. Now, the issue is that uh, the situation of the national funding for research in Europe is a situation of fragmentation and frequent applications. And through this uh, coordination effort, uh, we have set up the agenda that Engen has been discussing, and we believe that there is a clear opportunity to obtain a very high um, benefit cost ratio in research and innovation on water in the water energy nexus through coordination of European agendas and through the development of um, 
European uh, joint uh, calls like the one we just had for emerging pollutants and next year we are going to have, be having a call for about 30 million, uh, 30 million euro uh, which is a very sizable amount for research on water devoted to technologies and having a specific, uh, specific um, regards to the water and energy nexus. So that is for us a clear opportunity and uh, we in the organization and in Mineco, the ministry I'm representing here today, identify this as a, as a very noble endeavor and one that will bring cost effectiveness to our research invest and innovation investments. Thank you very much, Enrique. Um, Mark, if you don't mind, um, can you pl please tell us a bit about the project that I mentioned in my overview presentation and probably you have some more in mind to talk about uh, what is being done by IUCN and, and other partners to build um, partnerships, to build platforms and sustainable development, which focuses on most of the time forgotten nature ecosystems uh, dimension. So just a small question, just a small issue. Well, <laughs> So uh, the, the project that Engen outlined, uh, as he said, is called the Nexus Dialogue on Water Infrastructure Solutions. It's um, focused, therefore, on, on in, in some respects on a subset of this broader Nexus question where we're looking at where, where are the leverage points for, uh, for optimizing uh, uh, our approach to the Nexus using water infrastructure. And as Engen outlined, we, in the first part of this project, we're running a series of workshops uh, of which we've completed two so far. So to start with, I wanted to um, just uh, reflect on, on some of the, 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 the dialogue around partnerships that's come out of those workshops. And as you, as you will have picked up from, 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 the, from that slide and from some of the things I said earlier when I was talking about Stockholm Water Week, uh, one of our interests as IUCN is, is very much how do you take um, how do you take the translate the need and the desire and the objectives for um, more sustainable, for more optimal uh, water uh, natural resource management in this case in our case water resource management. How do you translate that into really practical action? on the ground, uh, what are uh, um, uh, workable strategies and bankable projects that lead to implementation? So really to implementation. So in our workshops, we start with some discussion about the nexus that we're all getting very used to. And then uh, the way we, we work these workshops is with looking at a set of, um, of, of river basins. So in, in each case, five river basins in each region. And they work through a visioning process for their basin uh, with stakeholders from the different sectors participating at least to the extent that we're, we're able to manage. And out of that comes uh, some, some uh, useful pointers to what are the partnership needs and opportunities on the ground. So when, when people are talking about what are the real issues that we have to tackle, in, uh, in the Rio Santa in Peru, uh, who needs to be there doing it? And what, what, what are the drivers that are going to bring them together? Uh, so that's a, that's, a, that's a good example, actually. The Rio Santa in Peru is somewhere where there's, uh, there's a, to be very simple about it, there's an upper basin and a lower basin. In the upper basin, uh, they have issues around, around glaciers, but the, and there's a lot of... Uh, uh, investment in, in use of water for hydropower. In the lower basin, uh, closer to the coast, is irrigation. So, so they face, uh, uh, from the basin perspective, uh, a set of nexus-related water resource problems and, and a set of uh, decisions that they need to make about how they use and manage their, their water infrastructure in, in, in tackling those problems. So around the table, then, we have the National Water Agency of Peru. We have Duke Energy, which is a pri big private energy company, of course, that, that is uh, uh, operating dams there, and the Irrigation Board. And one of the things they have to face up to is there's a, there's a conflict uh, amongst the various stakeholders, to the point, a conflict, disputes, 
to the point where, where dialogue amongst those stakeholders is very, very difficult. Um, so the idea of optimizing the, the use of the resource and the way infrastructure is used in the basin uh, is, provides one leverage around which you can uh, start to unpick that conflict and help, uh, help people to find a way through it. Uh, and to um, uh, having them around the table, then they can find, and they're doing this, this also themselves, find practical, concrete things that they can talk about in the context of resolving their conflicts and then start to do in terms of implementation. So taking the nexus, um, I don't want to use this word pejoratively, taking the nexus rhetoric in so doing and really placing that within solving real problems on the ground through partnerships amongst the people that, that need to be working together. And with the basis where we, we've been uh, including in these workshops, you have some variant of, of those kinds of opportunities and discussions uh, that you can identify in each of them. Uh, and, and then one of the, the key points, just to finish up about, um, about uh, in more generic terms, how this can be taken forward, is the, is the idea of innovation around institutions. And, and very quickly in our workshops comes the question, all sorts of questions about institutions and governance and the way sectors relate to different, different uh, institutions and policies and so on. And it gets very complicated very quickly, as with anything to do with the nexus. And, and with that, you have the realization that there's a temptation to be strongly resisted to start building big nexus institutions. And rather to say what we need are are very, if you like, mobile and flexible collaborative platforms in which the kinds of players I just described for the center base could come together, jointly work on problems, uh, find support in various ways, and then go away back to their sectors, back to their companies, back to their institutions, and do what they're good at, but do it in ways that, that are informed and, 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 and informing the, the respective partners. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Paolo, would you like to add uh, something regarding the, the particular question of um, partnership opportunities in your presentation? You talked about um, the fact that uh, there are existing partnerships between um, research communities, for example, your university and um, the local government. Um, how, I mean, it, how do you see the possibility of pulling uh, private sector into this equation? What, what do you see the possibilities? Um, if you can just expand on this just a bit, a few words, if possible. Sure. Uh, as I told before, the, uh, these researches, uh, the, the collaboration, the partnership between uh, um, the, 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 the universities or uh, research center with uh, with the uh, local government, with the public uh, uh, administration is fundamental. But uh, uh, this can, I think that this must be viewed as a, a, a first step just to, uh, uh, to bring also the private sector in, the, uh, in, in this kind of works because uh, uh, um, the, I, I, I'm talking about uh, geothermal energy, but uh, the, the research in geothermics uh, needs the, uh, the investment of uh, uh, a lot of money. As a consequence, uh, uh, the, the, private, the private sector is, uh, is fundamental. But uh, um, if uh, the, um, the, the there are the, the, the conditions, of course, by the point of view of, of course, of the resource, but also of the, um, the, the, the intention of the, 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 the public, of the government, of the, um, the, the private sector rights. <laughs> because uh, I, I talked about uh, uh, the, the case of Italy before, and uh, in this case, uh, there are several uh, private companies, uh, Italian private companies, but also uh, foreign companies that uh, um, are attracted 
by the potentiality of uh, uh, geothermal potentiality of uh, uh, Italian territory and uh, as I told before we have uh, more than 50 permits of research uh, concession a new concession in addition to the, 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 the the, the, the historic uh, uh, concession of uh, Inel in the Larderello and Monte Amiata region. We have more than 50 new uh, permits of research at various stages of development, but uh, for instance, Sorgenia, we hope that uh, uh, they are working, they are carrying out uh, uh, new geophysical, geochemical, geological investigation in the Monte Amiata and Lardrello region and we hope that uh, within next year and uh, uh, probably within uh, 2015 they, they will be able to uh, carry out the first deep wells just to check the, the geothermal resources in uh, at least one of their permits, probably two. So uh, the, the, the private sector is, uh, is uh, I think, is uh, fundamental for developing uh, uh, this kind of research. But uh, the, 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 the private, uh, I think, that uh, um, must uh, um, favor the uh, investment. Uh, I think mainly. Uh, reducing uh, some, and it, I, I am talking about Italy, uh, but I think that maybe is common to also in other countries, uh, reducing the uh, bureaucracy and uh, uh, that in many cases is uh, uh, very uh, is, uh, uh, heavy, uh, um, uh, is an obstacle to the, uh, to to the investment and uh, um, uh, th this uh, may uh, uh, along the, 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 the time uh, uh, for having a permits, for having a license uh, and uh, of course for the private invest invest investments, investments uh, this, uh, this, is a, this is a problem of course. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, the bureaucracy limiting <laughs> the, the private sector's involvement is something which is familiar to most of the colleagues yeah. uh, <laughs> sitting in the audience. Um, Paul, now, uh, talking about IASA, in my overview presentation, I, um, I, I tried to highlight some of the strengths of um, IASA. And uh, I mean, just to, to, to summarize, if you have to talk about two strengths, only two strengths of IASA, uh, the, fir the first strength of your organization would, would definitely be uh, research. And uh, the way I see it, the second strength of IASA is building partnerships. I know that IASA is doing that uh, since the time of the Cold War, and it's facilitating building many partnerships around the world. Can you please expand on this a bit? And I understand that you would like to use some uh, slides. Then, Paolo, can you please? Sure, man. Take care. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Igen. I think uh, my participation here is in itself the advantage of being a partner because uh, IASA and uh, the World Water Assessment Program uh, are partners in um, an initiative, an innovative initiative on world water features and, and scenarios. And we have been in this partnership for quite some time now. I will talk about this uh, later. Um, but it's also a pleasure to talk about my research organization, uh, an organization that has a history, uh, like uh, Egan was saying, from the Cold War, and we pride ourselves of being there in the, from the Cold War to uh, global warming. So um, it, it's, it's, it's really good to, to have this opportunity to talk about it. Yeah? Uh, we have a vision 
And the vision is to be a world leader in systems analysis because this is what we do and this is what we know how to do. And to address solutions uh, that uh, can, I mean, to find solutions that can address global problems. Because we know some, most of the problems that we, we, we talk about as being global are sometimes uh, regional, ex uh, except probably for the issue of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. But several problems are local. But because they occur in so many places, they tend to have a global dimension. And it, no one country or no one research institution or no no small group of people can address this. So these are global issues and they have to be tackled uh, in that regard. So we have uh, research groups on food. We have uh, research programs on water. We have uh, research programs on energy and climate change, poverty and equity. So these are all very uh, challenging problems in our societies today. And we know that these problems are interlinked. We have been talking about this in the last two or three days now. And we use these linkages between these problems to address, uh, to, to look for, for solutions. So the focus mainly is on uh, global problems. We emphasize that the type of research there is uh, policy driven. It's a policy driven research, so demand driven uh, applied research. Uh, mainly using uh, systems analysis uh, and also trying to build capacity to increase the capacity of institutions that uh, can solve these problems. So um, we also have innovative elements within uh, our research. So for example, we are trying to understand uh, the drivers that uh, are behind some of these problems. For example, the, uh, the changing demographic landscape, the growth in population. So we have a population group that looks at the diffusion also of, we also look at the diffusion of new technologies. So we've been talking here about transitions in energy technologies or in water uh, technologies in order to uh, address some of the challenges we mentioned here on the link between water and energy. Um, in the population group, groundbreaking research recently on the importance of educating the girl child with regard to fertility or to eliminating poverty. So these are some of the, of the things. Or urbanization. We have now um, strong research going on, on for example, the, the impact of variability in, I mean, a variability in stream flow in developing countries, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, on rural urban migration. So can we solve the problem of rural urban migration by addressing the huge variability in stream flow in rural areas, or should we just remove or move the population into urban centers and then address the problem in a smaller, uh, in a smaller unit or in a smaller landscape, but of course, again, with its own uh, challenges. So all of these uh, elements of YASA research, so it is integrated research, it is interdisciplinary research, it is international in the sense that we work with partners around the world, and we talk about this in a few slides. It is also independent. So even though we are based in Austria, uh, we thank the Austrian government because we are located in a beautiful palace. It used to be the, the summer palace of the Austrian monarchy. But we have very little influence by them. Uh, they support our research, but we are independent, and independent of several countries also that are national members, member organizations. So it's long term. Uh, we address trade-offs in the systems way. So, um, past successes, you probably, some of you have had some of the achievements we have, we have done, apart from the big achievement in reducing air pollution, especially in, in Europe, some of the, the, the models that we are used there. Recently, the, the global energy assessment, uh, the IPCC reports, YASA has been actively involved in this. We've also been able to advise the UN Secretary General, and we are happy that he was able to visit us quite recently at, 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 at our institute. Um, we have new focus uh, now. We are establishing policy dialogues and relationships. Also, I'll talk about this when I mention the partnership uh, research program we have with the World Water Assessment Program through UNESCO and other partners. 
We have also a link. We are now trying also to continue the, the long-term relationship we have with our global partners by reaching out to not only the partners we worked with before, but also new partners. Uh, and we are collaborating also with local uh, policy and scientific institutions. I'll give you some examples. Uh, the, the research is interdisciplinary. So even though YASA is sometimes known as an institute of mathematicians, it is not entirely true because it's only one third of the researchers are mathematicians. And, and strictly speaking, they are not entirely mathematicians because they have background in several other areas. But to give you just a summary of the picture, how it looks like, we have um, half of it actually natural scientists and social engineers, or engineers and social scientists, and one third, or roughly uh, less, than, less than one, one third uh, mathemat mathematicians and others. So, yes, let me speed up. So these are some of the YASA member uh, academies. So it's a, an organization of research organizations. So that's in itself an umbrella organization of, of partners. Um, here's a list of countries where we have our partners and our member organizations. Uh, funding uh, mostly comes from the partner members. We have a budget of uh, 16 million in 2011. Uh, 20 national member organizations, and the list, is continue, the list continues to grow, and 50-plus organizations that sponsor research at YASA. Uh, we also try to build capacity of young scientists. So we have the Young Scientist Summer Program. So every year we have 50 young people coming to the, enviro um, to the YASA environment, interacting with uh, senior colleagues and researchers around the world and developing their capacity. Uh, I don't know if I still have some time to talk uh, a little bit, just two slides on the initiative, or I can leave it, and maybe question times. Uh, given the we question time, I can. A bit later. Okay, then that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's clear that for a sustainable future, for sustainable development, building partnerships are important. And there are many solutions on the ground. Um, Mark, he talked about the project that is that was launched recently by IUCN and other partners. Paul, he talked about the work that IASA is doing. Paolo, he talked about um, the partnership, an ongoing partnership between research institutions, universities, and local governments. And Enrique, he, <laughs> it was, he, he let some of the pressure go, and uh, he shared <laughs> <laughs> some of the challenges that he has been facing dealing with, uh, with the member states, uh, European partners, and, and, other, um, and other partners. Now, um, um, practically, this question has been um, answered by, by Paolo, Paolo and, and Enrique. But my question to two other panelists is that um, what are the pitfalls and challenges that you see in forming uh, partnerships? What can be improved? So if you can share your views on this. Uh, I think one, one of the pitfalls that, that is clear to us in these dialogues that I've been talking about is complexity, <laughs> right? We're dealing with very complex. We very quickly, when we start talking about the nexus and the kinds of issues, that we've been seeing on the screen and so on, we very, things very quickly get very complicated. And then you layer on top of that new technologies and so on. Um, and as I explained, in, in our work, we're, we're, we're having our discussions around basins. And it's really clear that if you have a discussion around a smaller basin, like the Rio Santa I mentioned, then you can find the problems. And then you can find the people that need to work together to, to, uh, to work on them. But if you, if you, when you start talking about a much bigger basin, and the example we had in one of our workshops was the Magdalena River in Colombia, and and every 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 uh, uh, new round of the discussion around the table, there was a whole other set of issues that 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 that, that were, were complicating factors and making it very murky as to where on earth would you start. So one of our our conclusions was was that. To, You've got to make this all manageable, and that, that applies also to, to bringing the partners together. 
And, and that, that means about being careful about where you put the boundaries around the problem. Um, so if you're dealing with a big basin, of course, it doesn't mean you ignore that it's a huge basin, the, the, the Nile or whatever. But, but you have to tackle it in a, in a manageable way and put boundaries around the problem. Uh, and therefore, who should be at the table, who should be working together in, a, in an appropriate way. As I mentioned in my overview presentation, ES uh, has been able to build, successfully build um, partnerships even in the worst times of the Cold War. Um, what is the secret to building uh, success, successful partnerships? What is the magic ingredient? How does, how does IASA do that? So, um, well, there's one secret to it. It's uh, what every business organization do. Um, Examine your strengths, your weaknesses. Look out for the threats and opportunities. Uh, I think ESA success mainly in applied research at the global level and in maintaining partners is to try as much as possible not to compete with its partners. This is quite difficult because sometimes uh, you want to work with someone or an organization and you, you are doing almost the same thing. But you want to avoid this. And well, in, in our case, we, we know we have a, an international reputation, so other organizations or other research organizations want to affiliate with us, so this is a huge strength we have, and we show this out. We also know that we have a huge data bank, and this is also a strength we have, and we, 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 we sell this out. Uh, another, another way we, we deal with it is to, is to, to value what they have. So, for instance, uh, the initiative, the Water Futures and Solutions Initiative, is a multi-model assessment. So we don't have all the tools at IASA. Especially, we don't have all the tools to evaluate how much water is there, or to evaluate how much water is demanded by the energy sector, by the manufacturing sector, by agriculture. We have done some individual works in some areas, like in agriculture, for the FAO, for a long time. But we acknowledge also that uh, even if we have some of the tools, a multimodal assessment using multiple models can actually be of mutual benefit, not only for ourselves, but for the, for the partnership as a whole. So we try to bring this out in, in our partnership. Thank you, Paul. Um, perhaps at this stage, we should stop a bit and ask if there are any questions from the audience. Questions? Issues that, would, that you would like to share? Um, some of your experiences? Hi, I have a question about geothermal. I think uh, if you use geothermal directly just to heat the houses, you don't use any water, I understand, but if you use geothermal as power, then it, you're still using the steam cycle, and then you need water for cooling. Is that correct? And can you elaborate a little bit then how much water geothermal power needs? Thank you. For power production, uh, of course, uh, in some cases, uh, you need uh, the water for uh, uh, the refrigeration towers. But with the new technology, with the binary cycle technologies, uh, the, um, the fluids never, uh, uh, never um, contact the env external environment. All fluids is, are injected in the subsoil. And the, the, the secondary, the working fluids, the organic fluids, are often uh, um, uh, cooled by higher, simply air cooling uh, uh, towers. So without any any consumption of water. So in some cases uh, where we have uh, a geothermal fluids with very high temperature, for instance, Lardrello, 340 degrees. Uh, we need uh, uh, the refrigeration tower with uh, the use of water. 
but in many cases uh, with the actual, uh, the present technologies, uh, we don't need uh, water for uh, uh, cooling the, the, the fluids. Uh, for instance, in a couple of years ago in uh, New Zealand, uh, um, a new power plants of about uh, one, uh, 100 megawatt electrics with fluid um, at temperature more than uh, 200 degrees, so uh, high temperature geothermal fluids is uh, this new power plants uh, um, uh, was uh, was built uh, with uh, binary cycle by by Ormat technologies uh, without any uh, injection in the atmosphere of any kind of fluids, neither either. Uh, uh, vapor and uh, particularly in uh, gases such as CO2 or, uh, or H2S. So uh, in many cases we can prevent the, the use of water for, uh, also for uh, cooling. Uh, please, my, my question is for Mr. Smith. Uh, you have told about the experience in, in basins, in different basins in Colombia, Peru, but I suppose that they are um, in national basins. Do you have any experience in international basins? Thank you. Yeah, from our, from in this process that we're running. So another uh, couple of basins that we have had done this process with was the Lake Victoria Basin and also the Niger Basin. The Niger Basin offers a, offers a nice example also to think through, uh, where you have, an, uh, you have um, uh, quite an agenda of dam building along the basin with, with therefore, uh, upstream and downstream relationships in terms of uh, energy and food production opportunities. Um, and the, 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 one of the conclusions from those discussions was that, that to to really tackle the question of how, how do you optimize water infrastructure, they need to look at sub-basins. So how do the different sectors work together at a sub-basin level? And then be able to link that analytically to, to the, the bigger basin and the, and the bigger questions. Because it gets all tangled up with, with national policy questions and national politics and regional institutions. Um, so to make the analytical problem, make the practical problem uh, actionable, they said we need to break it down to a sub-basin level and then, and then link that to, that to the wider, very complex landscape of institutions and governments and so on. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions, one for Paolo and one for Mark. Um, for Paolo, I'm very interested in your uh, experience, like in, in terms of the, the, you, you, the research outcome generated, like the Umbria's geothermal zoning. Um, and does it mean that like the, the zone, like for example, the zone with the highest potential, like then you make the data very open to the developer, the project developer, so they know where they can get the maximum um, energy generation or thermal potential, um, and then and then in terms of the government, like I'm just thinking about how different stakeholders use your um, the outcome of your project. Like from the government side, you were talking about cutting out bureaucracy, which is of course a huge concern. So th is the local government taking that on to say, okay, so n now we know this zone, we prefer people to go and develop thermal geothermal projects there and then we would speed up your process, for example. Uh, the zoning we carried out uh, is, of course, uh, uh, for the, the government, for the public that uh, wanted to be informed about the potentialities of their territories. And uh, they use, I think, the, 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 the goal of this, uh, that, that is the goal of the project we carried out is to, to um, uh, the public administration want to be uh, informed and want to be uh, able to direct uh, 
the uh, possible uh, private investor, private companies that want to be uh, come over their territories to make investment, to re uh, request uh, permits of research. As a consequence, uh, with these uh, um, the works we, we carried out, uh, they asked to us to, to make a, a zoning of their territory. Because we, we, honestly, we didn't like too much to make this uh, uh, um, zoning. So, because there are many, uh, uh, many points that must be taken into account when you uh, consider a territory. But the uh, public administration uh, asked to us to uh, make, uh, a, under some point of view, a simplification of the problem just to have the uh, first uh, image you know, uh, for uh, making the decision about uh, the possible private investor that arrives, uh, that they hope arrive, but they are arriving because uh, it seems that uh, uh, one new permit of research uh, was uh, asked in Umbria and another um, is uh, in the area of Castel Giorgio is uh, going on and uh, they, they carried out uh, the first researches and they hope to, to, to be, um, begin the drilling uh, in a few months, one hour, one, one year, more or less. Thank you very much. Um, for, for Mark, my question is uh, uh, for the, because you, you work on the water basin level and one of the challenges I find often in the, um, when we're researching the impacts is it's really hard to know what the other water users are using and the quantity. Um, how do you overcome that, that uh, barrier um, in terms of getting the data? Oh, I think you have to, in, in any of this sort of thing, you have to um, couple it with, um, with assessments of hydrology and water audits and, uh, and assessments of how water is being allocated amongst different users. Um, in, our, in our work, we, we do that through applying environmental flows approaches. So it has to be backed by, by rigorous assessments for sure. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Um, I guess it's about time to, to wrap up the session. And before I do that, I would like to just tell some of the, some of the, the buzzwords that I heard from uh, the panelists. Um, those buzz, buzzwords are... Uh, um, the necessity to translate the need to practical actions on the ground, identifying partnerships, but not partnerships, not building partnerships for the, for the sake of building partnerships, but uh, building sustainable partnerships oriented towards finding solutions. Uh, everybody knows that Nexus issues get really complicated really fast. So it's important to make things manageable. So keeping it simple is still the best approach. Um, we talked about how to involve a uh, private sector. It, um, it's involving private sector is really important uh, just to be able to get more funding, to be able to get uh, some creative thinking, thinking going. But um, I, as I also highlighted in my um, the overview presentation, um, enabling environments, making sure that the enabling environment is in place. And um, unfortunately, this is not the case even in the, in the most developed countries. For example, Paolo, um, he was candid. He, he told us that in a developed country like Italy, still bureaucracy is one of the main challenges uh, blocking uh, building uh, meaningful partnerships. Now, with this, I would like to ask each of the panelists to say a few words, take home messages, 
so that um, this can, these can be all recorded and uh, shared for the, for the use of public at large. Mark, can we start with you? Yeah, I'll, I'll just reiterate one of the things I said earlier, which is uh, as, as we look toward working with a water energy nexus or water energy food nexus in, in, in practical terms to solve real problems as they exist on, on the ground, we have to, we have to create a flexible, adaptive, collaborative platforms for those sectors to come together, uh, work jointly, and then go back and implement what they decide to do. As, as concern, uh, as regarding uh, geothermics, I think that uh, uh, geothermal energy uh, uh, can represent a viable solution for uh, uh, energy needs in many countries, or uh, of course uh, can uh, contribute significantly, contribute to the energy produ uh, power production in many countries, and it represents uh, if. Uh, uh, it's uh, with a correct management of the resource uh, can represent uh, a very uh, uh, environmentally safe uh, kind of renewable energy at all. Well, I just wanted to say that partnerships are about uh, trust. Uh, partnerships permit to go one step beyond. It's not about doing more. It's about go climbing to a different level, to a higher level. And uh, the development of trust is a very complex process which uh, progresses at the speed of human relations. It cannot progress at a different uh, speed. And therefore, time is required in order to achieve this higher level of things. Paul, well, before uh, you, you say the, the, the last words, um, I would like to clarify one, one thing about um, the common projects <laughs> that uh, WAP Secretariat and ESA is working together, uh, the scenario project for future solutions. What I would like to highlight is that um, this project, the scenario project, which started recently, a few years back, um, WAP Secretariat and ESA were uh, the initiating partners. But now we are looking at a larger network, and UN Water is a dimension of that larger network. UN Water with its 31 um, member, uh, members and, and a number of uh, participating um, um, institutions and partners are now also playing um, a, a key critical role uh, to, to move this project uh, further into uh, its completion stage. Paul, now, please. Well, I will conclude by emphasizing also the strength uh, for research organizations, the strength they could have in partnership. Um, they should look at partnership not only among research organizations uh, with similar identity as themselves, but also partnership with uh, industry, partnership with uh, policy makers and decision makers. And we have a good example with this because with the Water Features and Solutions uh, Initiative, I have a few flyers here. You could pick them if you want some more information. I'll give this to you. We have two, uh, what we call two stakeholder groups. So there is a sector up talks group from, um, uh, these are people in industry, people from utilities, uh, also, we have a scenario focus, the scenario focus group. So we have a partnership with, with those two type of people, and we, we develop our scenarios, we develop our models, but then we interact with them in a reiterative process, take it back to them, and they give us their feedback, and this partnership is, uh, gets uh, stronger. Last, lastly, let me just say that uh, uh, we, we have spent some good time here talking about uh, what we need to do uh, to address some of the challenges we have seen uh, between uh, the link between water and energy. If, if, if we want to continue this, this, this dialogue, or if we want to continue to solve these problems, I think we should invest in capacity development. So uh, I want to invite you to join us in uh, the discussion. I don't want to preempt the decision that will be taken by, uh, the, uh, by CIWI, but we, we are hopeful that we are able to host uh, a workshop at the, the, the World Water Week in, in, in Stockholm on capacity development for the water energy nexus. And without 
saying so much, I'll, I'll say I'll invite you to that if we succeed in getting a place there. But I think we will. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for their valuable input and uh, also the, the audience for their attention and the, and the questions that they asked. Now, we have wrapped.